It is always fun to meet new people and to share their stories and their inspirations with you. That's what we do really every week here on The Big Impact. And our guest today comes to us from, in my world, kind of across the lake, if you don't mind. Because in Michigan, when we look across Lake Michigan, we see, well, we sort of know that it's there, Wisconsin. And that is where we find our guest today, Dr. Lona Cook. Since 2010, she has been a practicing chiropractor in Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin, We'll talk a little chiropractic today, but for the most part, we want to talk about the concept of healing, getting better in many, many different ways. And she's launching a book called Reclamation, and we'll get into that as well. So first, hello, how are you? Yeah, I'm great. Thanks for having me, Bill. This is fun for me to do podcasts outside the chiropractic profession now. So thank you for having me. Yeah. Now, see, today you're on my table. You know, I get to do all the adjustments and make all the cracking noises. So yeah, there you go. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, you have taken a lot of experiences and observations and rolled them into a into a book called Reclamation. Uh, before we get into the guts of the book, how hard is it to take all those thoughts that are in your head and put them onto onto paper? Yeah. Well, I think that it's it's like kind of like birthing. You know, I it's so near and dear to me that it's hard for me to even see it because it is the thoughts that have been marinating in my head for, in this case, with this book, 10, 12 years. Um, and so I hope I did a good job with it. I think I did a good job with it, but then as I think about it, cause it's so much of my story, I also realized, Oh, I could have added that in or that in. So I tell some of my closest friends that have read it, like, help me see this for what it is because it's like your child. Everyone thinks their child is cute. But is, is your child actually cute? <laughs> sometimes you don't want to know that answer. Yeah, you know, right. Sometimes it can be better not to have the answer. Uh, mm -hmm. And one of the things that I've appreciated about my friends who are in some way involved in either chiropractic or in traditional medicine uh, is that they have concerns that go beyond the practice that they're in. So, you know, for, for instance, uh, from what I gather and reading and doing a little background research on on our conversation today, your concerns for people go beyond having a spine that might need adjusting and yeah. beyond that to the concept of overall healing. So, but rather than me pretend to know what motivates you, what what is the purpose of reclamation? Yeah. Oh man, that opens up a huge conversation. If I'm trying to make it simple, I would say as my life changed through many of the things that chiropractic taught me, which a lot of the focus of chiropractic is this inside out or innate healing, but it also connected me back to, um, you know, some people would call it your soul or your spirit. Um, just, you know, we're more than just our physical bodies. And when we look at healing, we're certainly more than our physical body, but I think we haven't always been taught that, you know, especially in our modern medicine, we kind of come compartmentalize so much that, that we can think, oh, it's my kidney. And it's only to do with my kidney. If I have a kidney issue, when we forget that there's a whole person and a whole life that has been part of what led up to that problem potentially. So for myself, as I went through witnessing people heal on my table, witnessing people not heal on my table, trying to understand more about what this thing called life is. And certainly as I kind of dove down the rabbit hole of mind, body, spirit, I was witnessing it also within myself and my family and those I know closest and healings and, and things that, you know, also were kind of radical transformations, both within my life, as well as those close to me. And it, it also just really underlined that we're just starting to scratch the surface on so many things that we know about the human experience and who heals and who doesn't. And um, especially this past year, everyone wants to point at science. They use that word very um, fluently, but not always in the right context. And I would like to remind people like science is the questioning and continuing to learn. Um, so it's never really actually settled. Um, and I certainly think when we come to human health, we're starting to scrape the surface of how much bigger we are than just our physical bodies. And so that's part of what this book is about, is about diving into your own life, asking yourself the deep questions and some of the stories you've maybe told yourself about your life, not just your physical body, and then seeing if they're really serving you and serving what you want from your health and well-being. Um, I'm a person of faith who believes that uh, when scripture says we are fearfully and wonderfully made, that that's really an awesome concept. I mean, when you think about 
a creator with intent and making each of us in his image and in a very unique way. You know, we talk about how there are no two snowflakes alike. Well, there are there's a lot of people on this planet, all of whom are different. Uh, some have said that I'm very different from, from others. And I don't know that they always meant that as a compliment, but I'll have to think about that a little bit more. But, but the learning process never really stops, right? From a, whether it's from a medical standpoint or from an overall, just a, a holistic study standpoint, we discover different things through the experiences that we have. So what, what happened in your world that sort of propelled you into thinking bigger picture? Yeah. Well, it didn't happen with healing to start with, at least in the context that we most think about with a problem in the body. Um, I was about to graduate chiropractic school and I was, if I look at my personality up until that point, and it's still some of my personality. So I'm not saying it's all wrong. It's just, I was a driver personality. I push, 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 made things happen. And it was um, in that last month or two before I would have gone into my last um, rotation for school that it was kind of like God or the universe, whatever word you want to use. I don't get too worked up about semantics. God is fine for me to say. And I think with you, you just opened the door for me to use that. Um, but it, I was getting a pretty hard and fast uh, sign to change how I was living my life. And I thought I was moving out to California. I thought I was going to do lots of things differently. And, you know, I got held up at gunpoint. I had a lot of kind of radical things happened that were definitely pauses to me. Excuse me. I'm going to shut that because my child is yelling outside. Um, anyways, when, when those things happen, it caused me to pause and that pause I had never really allowed myself to have before where I had time to look at what the decision I was making and actually give myself permission to take a step back and possibly back down, which I generally did not do. And um, I really look at that as like me reconnecting. Um, I had made choices up until that point that weren't always in my best interest, but I couldn't see it. I was still in it. Um, and I think a lot of younger adults feel that way. Sometimes you're just kind of going along with the masses. Sometimes that's good. Sometimes that's not good. Um, but I was actively making poor decisions at times. And so as I found myself all of a sudden not doing what I said I was going to do, I didn't move out to California. I found myself back home in Wisconsin, which is the kind of the last place I thought I was going to end up and not sure if I was going to open a practice or work for someone. It was humbling. And in that moment, it really allowed me to try and rediscover what I actually wanted to create because I didn't know. And that felt foreign too, to not just keep pushing on. So that was an awakening moment for me. And it was like the second I stopped fighting and pushing all of a sudden, all these kind of wonderful things started to happen where, you know, a woman called me, I didn't even know out of the blue and offered to open, um, the practice with me and, and answer phones for free. And I didn't even know her. It was just like really weird things that you think, well, that's supposed to be hard. The first bank I went to gave me my first business loan. And so, you know, it was kind of miraculous and I could see like, Oh, how I had been living <laughs> felt hard. And all of a sudden this new, these new things that were starting to kind of creep in felt different, felt lighter. Um, and so as, as I moved in that direction and kind of went with the flow for the first time in a while, um, I started to see like, wow, I can actively use my internal guidance or this connection. And it helps sometimes when I'm not just trying to force everything. And I, I think that's part of the healing that was offered to me. And so that's part of what our bodies are always showing us too, is signals to pay attention to. Again, we don't generally pay attention to them. No. And, and, you know, you, you, you went past it fairly quickly, but I know a key part of your story is somebody put a gun to you. Mm. Um, those, those moments uh, would bring about so many different thoughts. Of course, it would bring about terror, uh, a reflection on what, what happened? Why was I in this situation? Where did they come from? All these different things. And then is this going to change me? And if so, how? Mm -hmm. So I know you've told the story a few times before, but if you don't mind, take our, our listeners to that moment in your life when you wondered if your life was going to end. Well, I say this in the book, Bill, is that I, it happened so fast that I almost didn't have a chance to feel 
fear in the moment because it was so quick. It was, um, uh, I was in Costa Rica for a rotation. I was staying at an apartment. They had told us not to, you know, walk by ourselves places. What did I do? I walked by myself places. <laughs> and so um, a motorcycle pulled up in front of me and kind of blocked the path that I was walking on to go to the internet cafe. This was back in like 2005. And um, as I was, as I was you stopped because they were probably 10 feet in front of me. Um, the guy that was on the back, there's two men jumped off and I felt something in my, in my ribs and I looked down and it was a gun and they took the stuff that I had in my pockets and on my back and off they went. Um, and I was standing there about halfway to the internet cafe and halfway <laughs> to go back to the apartment and didn't know what, what I should do. So of course I went to the internet cafe cause I figured I got to keep walking one way or the other. Um, and it, it really was stunning. I mean, that's the best word I can give it is because I didn't have a long enough time to have almost a fear response in that moment. Cause it was so quick. It was stunning. And so much of what was going to unfold for me in the next 30 days after that was like, I was stunned. I was stunned enough to just take a pause. And I, I feel like God gives us very literal nudges sometimes. Yeah. And we just, you know, we don't even see them for what they are. It's like, it's, it's wild to me how much it is literal sometimes. And yet we're so dense that we don't see these nudges happening. Um, our bodies are a great example of that too. Um, but again, we haven't been taught that. So a lot of times we just think it's coincidence and we chalk it up to that. So was there a time after this quick hit and run that all of a sudden you came through the shock of it and started shaking or crying or were you did you ever have the moment where you're like hey wait a minute <laughs> this just happened to me I I think it took me a little bit because like I said I was stunned so I I remember feeling like excited to come back home which usually wasn't a normal response for me not because my home was a bad place I just loved traveling and um I got back and I was in a clinic in Minnesota doing, you know, some of my schooling and the doctor I worked for, she was, um, she's from the East coast from Pittsburgh, very direct. And she turned around in her chair. It, there was something else that happened that day that I think caused her to just feel like she needed to speak to me. And, and she also Christian. And so she just said, I feel like God is telling you, you're not supposed to go to California. You're supposed to change the direction of what you're doing. Mm. And I think if she hadn't say, said that to me, I don't, I don't know. I feel like I would have gone out to California still. Um, but I drove home that night and I had about a 90 minute drive back to my parents' place. And I was supposed to leave with my mom the next day to go to California to start this last rotation and then work for a chiropractor out in San Diego. And I cried like the whole drive home on the highway, which obviously not safe, but also was not normal for me. I'm not a person who easily cries. And it was just kind of like everything that had just transpired as well as my self doubt, like, what am I going to do? Um, and I think a lot of students especially feel that at the end of schooling, we're so used to being in that rhythm of you just move on to the next grade, you go to college, you go to grad school, maybe, you know, like there's always kind of like a following the herd mentality. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden I was like, not following anyone anymore and was feeling like I was being like, let off the cliff where I didn't know where I was supposed to go next. Um, and it ended up being beautiful, but at the time it felt really scary. Our guest here on The Big Impact is Dr. Lona Cook. Her book is called Reclamation, and it's a focus on healing in many different ways. Even though she is a chiropractor and has been for a decade plus, this is on healing entirely, uh, all parts of our, of our being. And, and part of that healing process, you, you sort of described it as you're talking about when others would speak into your life and encourage you to do something different than you had planned part of that process to me seems like being willing to listen to sound advice. And here's the hard part, whether you say it out loud or whether you kind of think it to yourself as you're putting your head on the pillow at night, it's the willingness to say, all right, I got, I got to make some corrections here. Mm -hmm. And then, and then doing it, you know, that's, that's, that's kind of a mature step to take that not many are willing to take because doggone it, I don't want to be wrong. Mm -hmm. How yeah. hard is how hard is that step? I think the 
first couple times is probably the hardest, especially like for, for me, I, I'm sure there might've been other times, but that, that abrupt change that happened in my life right around the time of the gun holdup was, I just remember feeling very, very humbled. And because I felt like I didn't know what I was going to do next. I think that I needed to feel that in order to realize like you didn't die from backing down, (laughs) you know, that something actually better could happen if you, you know, kind of throw your hands up. You know, we talk about that. What were you supposed to do? Tackle the two guys and pretend like all of a sudden you're Wonder Woman and fully equipped with a martial arts skill (laughs) set? No, I mean more like what, what felt humbling to me wasn't the hold up. The whole, the hold up was, it really wasn't something that I think registered other than it, like I said, it stunned me. It was more what came afterwards when I, I thought I was moving to California. I told everyone that's where I was going. And then all of a sudden I, in the last 24 hours, don't go and kind of back down on this thing that seems like I'm supposed to do it. Yeah. Nobody's supposed to move to California. Just so you know, I mean, I, <laughs> you and I don't know each other very well, but I'm pretty confident that I can give you that advice. I'm with you on that. (laughs) Um, Yes. No, I'm very grateful. I'm here in Wisconsin now, but at the time and yeah, so I really do think that the willingness to just kind of pause with people and then realize like, it's okay to be wrong or it's okay to change your mind or it's okay to halfway do it and then change mid swing. You know, it's, it's okay. Um, I think we just make these things of like having to be right so much more important than actually living the life you want. Um, And so, yes, I think it's hard at first. And then I think when you see the byproduct of actually reflecting on what you want in your life, which isn't probably for most of us, that we don't really actually need to be right. We just need to have like love and connection and, and that type of thing. It gets easier. And being able to pursue something that really fits your passion. Um, I, I get really sad for people who are miserable, uh, mostly because of their vocational choices, uh, where they had this passion, they maybe even went to school for whatever the passion was, and they, they have, um, they could talk about their passion for hours on end, but it's not what they're doing by way of work. Uh, and it's, it's, it's tough to see, because it means that at some point for whatever reason, sometimes it's, it was just a matter of, I needed some money now and I never left the job or something. It's, it's sad to see. And part of, I think being whole and being well is being able, being able to pursue the things that you believe are important, that are a match with your skill set. And I'll bore you with a quick story. And I, I would gladly give credit to the speaker who I heard it from, but I can't remember who it was because it was several years ago. But this speaker was out to breakfast with a very wealthy businessman. And they were talking about passion and matching up passion to talent and pursuing dreams and being willing to get uncomfortable in the pursuit of those dreams. And the conversation was going back and forth between the two and the, the, um, consultant business or the speaker said to the businessman, I, I would be willing to bet that the young lady who's serving our table today did not grow up dreaming of being a waitress. That's not to demean the profession. It's, it's unlikely that that's what she dreamed of when she was nine, right? And so they struck up a conversation with her and were very gentle about it, but said basically, what was it that you dreamed of doing? you know, when you were, you were in high school and whatever. And she kind of got misty eyed. And she said, I always wanted to be a nurse. Mm -hmm. And so they said, Well, what, what kept you from going in that direction? And she talked about some decisions that she made in her life. And she was she became pregnant early, and she had to get a job in order to provide because she was a single mom. And she went through that story. And the wealthy businessman said, What would you do if today, Somebody said, you know what? It's time for you to pursue your dream. Um, we're going to take care of child care and tuition for you to get you entirely through nursing school. Would you do it? Because that's really the, the, the key moment of decision, right? The key moment of decision is, okay, 
now she didn't know if they were being hypothetical or if they were actually extending some sort of a ridiculous offer. And she said, Oh, I would do it in a heartbeat. I don't want to wear this apron anymore. I don't want to take orders anymore. I don't want to bring eggs and bacon to people anymore. And the businessman said, we're going to make that happen. Mm -hmm. And obviously it floored her and they eventually did. And the story ends with her being, and they said her name, I can't remember it, but it was like, and so he introduced her. I would like you all to welcome in the audience today, nurse, whatever. And obviously there wasn't a dry eye in the house. Why? Because it is worthy of celebration when you can help somebody get to a place of wholeness mm -hmm. and well-being, whether they've left the table in your chiropractic office or whether they have decided, you know what, I've had enough. It's mm -hmm. time for me to do what I know I'm supposed to be doing. What a powerful breakthrough that would be. Yes, that's awesome. And I agree with you that I think that is when I, you know, with people who are laying on my table, when I feel where things are imbalanced, at this point, I am certain that yes, you may sleep a certain way, or you may have a poor ergonomic setup, but that right there, what you just talked about, if they're not aligned with more of who they are meant to be at the core, that's part of what's creating these problems or these, you know, we call them diseases or lack of ease in our, in our body because we are meant for things that sometimes we get sidetracked from and never go back to. And I, mm. I think that creates imbalance in everything. Is there a way that you as a chiropractor can tell that about a patient when you put your hands on them and they say, you know, my lower back's really been killing me. And you're like, you know, I'm happy to adjust that. But have you considered and then you you follow with something that you're sensing from them. I'm not sure how you get to that diagnosis point. Yeah. Well, it's definitely not a diagnosis necessarily. Yeah. I think it's more of a medical scenario. And I, I think it goes back to rapport with the patient. You know, I may have intuition and things I can pick off, especially after doing, you know, this type of work for quite a while now. Um, but it, you have to have rapport with the person, just like any doctor needs to have rapport with the person that they're they're working with. Ultimately, I do believe the best doctor is the patient themselves. And so my, my role is more of a guide or a facilitator to hopefully help them realize some of these things, as well as, you know, they might understand it. Like, how many times have you gotten done with like exercise or something that helps your body feel better? And, and all of a sudden a great thought drops in or your next inspirational idea pops up or a conversation comes by. I mean, this is back to the whole idea that we're energy beings and, and certainly the energy in our body is related to all of this too. So sometimes I believe like if we can align the spine, then I don't know all the things that might shift for that person. But if their energy centers are more attuned, it's probably good for all aspects of their life. Um, and certainly if they're open to connecting some of these other dots, then I'd love to have conversations with them. Um, I, I was um, at a trade show back when those things existed. I don't know if you remember that era. <laughs> <laughs> it was forever ago, like 18 months ago. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and uh, you know, there were exhibitors of all sorts there. It was a golf trade show in Orlando, but there were a couple of exhibitors that I think set up a booth at every show and they're just there all the time. And one of them was this magic elixir potion to get all the toxins out of your body, right? If you would sit in their chair, put your bare feet in this little tub and by the time you pulled your feet out, the tub would be full of awfully gross, looked like algae water that they said came right from your body. And if you would buy their magic potion, then you could do this at home on your own and whatever. You know, it's, they're always there. Mm -hmm. But it, it reminded me of this concept of clutter and toxins and the things that we can have getting in the way of health. Mm -hmm. Whether what they were selling was snake oil or not, the concept I think is pretty real. Uh, that for a lot of us, we may have um, factors that are roiling about inside of either our psyche or maybe even our bloodstreams that are getting in the way of, of full good health. You mentioned how working out can really loosen up and make you just feel like a whole new person. When I go a couple of days without working out, I feel like a slug. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't know why that is. What have you learned about how the 
the mental side of our beings can be impacted just by exercise and the basics like that. Yeah. I, well, I think everybody knows at this point that exercise is good for them, right? And there's probably, depending on how we wanted to look at it, so many layers to why it's good for us. But, you know, we know that hormonally you create feel good hormones when you exercise. And so certainly that helps your mental state too. But because I like talking about energy, I just think about it like getting your energy moving. It clearly biochemically makes changes, but it also thinks about like, yeah, you're shifting yourself. You're shifting your state. Um, one of the books I love, 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 love is Hawkins work. Um, David Hawkins work. It's called power versus force. It's kind of the first book. And then there's other books that come off of it. And what it talks about is that someone who's in a state of, let's say, love or joy or peace, they vibrate extremely high and their energy can basically be felt by so many more people because of the, the state they carry energetically. And then someone who's maybe in more of an apathetic state or even like a shame state, very low, especially shame and guilt. And we all know that when we have things we feel shameful about, I certainly think that's part of what we feel in people's spines when they're really rigid is the stuff we can't let go of this, you know, it's not a life giving state. So when I think about energy and movement, when we exercise, you know, if I'm mad and I go for a run, I'm generally not mad after the run. So it's a state changer. And that's, I think half the battle for so many of us is to know when we're starting to feel some of those lower vibratory states and get out of them. Hmm. And the people with the worst health, I'll say, are generally people who stay in those lower states predominantly. They don't use some of the tools that are, you know, that most of us know, like don't eat crappy food, get sleep, exercise, all the basics, but they're all things that we actually have to do on a pretty routine, you know, cadence in our life. And then we have the ability to change our states and not stay in those emotions that are lower that we all experience at some point. We just don't want them as our dominant our dominant place we operate from. Let's just say hypothetically that somebody you knew, perhaps he was a radio and podcast host, was having a day where he started at 7 a.m. He already knows it won't end until 10.30 p.m. And he did something that he, ne I mean, never does. Uh, this is, again, hypothetical. Yeah. Yeah, he, over the course of a day where he knew he wouldn't be able to work out, ate two donuts and currently, hypothetically, feels like keeling over. <laughs> because his entire body is just overcome by all these different things that are not supposed to be there as well as the knowledge that there's not going to be a good workout coming up. Yeah. How do you power through a day where you just can't do what you know you're supposed to do? Grace. <laughs> it's, okay. it's okay. You ate two donuts. <laughs> Yeah, I'm feeling very guilty, by the way. Yeah, yeah, that doesn't help. The guilt doesn't actually do anything for us. <laughs> and maybe some water. <laughs> guilt and water. Okay, good combination. Oh, no guilt, more water. Oh, yeah. just more water. I'm going to have yeah. to drink a lot of water. <laughs> Our guest here today on The Big Impact is Dr. Lona Cook. Her book is called Reclamation. We're talking about healing all of you. She is a chiropractor, but this goes beyond that, to say the least. In fact, you're part of a an interesting event called a mastermind retreat. Mm -hmm. Now, I've always wanted to be considered a mastermind, like, you know, just on a maybe a cartoonish level. Um, <laughs> what, what is it like in real life to be part of a mastermind retreat? What does that mean? Yeah, uh, well, it means coming together with other generally like minded humans who are interested in evolving and growing and, and maybe similar businesses or similar reasons you've been brought together and then you learn from each other and we bring in speakers to learn from that are interested in healing and evolving and and living a better life every year um, and certainly helping others to do the same so our retreats currently but we're looking at other options for locations are in wisconsin at a big lodge and it's really fun and we have a lot of just great heart-centered people who are pretty open and willing to share and learn and receive. Like we were talking about earlier, you have to be willing to change and yeah. not everyone is ready for that, but a lot of people are. One of the, um, and I, I joke around a lot, but I'm very serious about this. I think one of the most powerful ways that we can improve our own health situations 
is to do something for somebody else. Mm -hmm. There's some un, uh, intangible surge of power that comes from knowing that you've done something special to help somebody else. I don't know what it is. Um, I've had people do very powerful and meaningful and special things for me. And it meant the world, but I could see that it meant a lot to them as well. And I'm trying, you know, the older I get, the more I try to actually make a difference because I'm a little slow, but I get there eventually. And when you can do something that encourages somebody else, um, I don't know what it is. Have you have you been able to research any of the, I don't know if it's a chemical thing or if it's uh, just an emotional boost that comes from making a difference on behalf of your neighbor? Well, I haven't researched it in that way, but here's my stab at this. I do believe we're all interconnected. Um, there's some work out there that Lynn McTaggart did on the field. Like we've all kind of heard these things. Like if, if people meditate in the United States, but they're focused on a different country, you know, the violence in that location goes down. Like there's something very real about how energy beings are connected. And, you know, again, we might say it's coincidence when you think of someone and all of a sudden they call, but is it really? Um, we're starting, I think science is starting to show us some of this like higher dimensional or um, like quantum aspect of life. Um, and so I have to imagine part of it is that when you do good to others, it flows back to you. It's like, it's reciprocal. It's, I really believe a universal law that you can't outgive the giver. And mm -hmm. so not only is it great for the people you serve, but that it comes back to you. And well, so and there's, there's clearly a flip side to that coin as well. And that if you're living a life that is just ruled by bitterness and selfishness and narcissism, you're going to be miserable. And, and all of us know somebody who's miserable. Yeah. And you know, they're probably a relative in some way. I, I remember being at a funeral for one of my favorite uncles, and it was attended by another member of the extended family who were not that close, but I was reminded of what a just an ornery, miserable person he is because he's mad at the world. And I read somebody said that uh, bitterness is like drinking poison and expecting somebody else to die. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was really powerful. So we talked about the good side of helping others. And I think it's probably wise to talk about the negative health ramifications for living a life that's just dominated by resentment, anger and bitterness. Yeah, I 100% agree. It's, it is the flip side of that. And you hold it in your body. You know, I, I think I, I was on a podcast last week with um, someone local here. And, you know, he had asked like, Oh, you know, you try and help people clue into things in their life that'll help them not get out of balance. We're talking chiropractic. And I said, Well, yeah, and he's like, what are some of the things you say? And I said, well, of course, everyone wants to know like things like, well, should I buy a new bed or should I get a new setup for my work? And I will talk to them about that. Certainly, I'm not trying to discredit that. But then I also want to just cut to and say like, okay, and if you hate your brother, you know, that's probably worse than your ergonomic setup as far as what's happening to your you know, your whole being, your whole physical body, as well as an extension of that. So I, I really do I think it, it is so important to recognize that we try and hide some of these things, but there's really no hiding from it. Just, you know, that connection we all have with God, the spirit, the soul, you can't, you can't put the ugly stuff away and not think it's not going to be ingested by you. It needs to be processed, it needs to be dealt with and brought to light. In the few minutes that we have left, let's let's talk for a, a bit about the physical ramifications of nutrition and how we are actually feeding our bodies, because I know that plays a big role in all of the other parts of it. So uh, what would Dr. Cook like everybody to know about that side of life? Well, I try and make it easier on people. And, and I think we've been so... Uh, programmed by what we see on the TV about food, especially since like the nineties, when it was like low fat, no fat, you know, and all this kind of chemical craze of our food being altered. So one of the things that I try and say is just think about what your great grandparents could have eaten and if, and how they would have gotten that food. So uh, egg from a chicken that is grown locally is going to be better than buying a carton of egg beaters because it's in its natural form. 
and you know, what way did God make the food? And then if you can start to ingest more of that, I think a lot of it takes care of itself. Now that is a very, you know, without knowing somebody's situation, that's just sound advice, I'd say. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I have a 98 year old father-in-law who who was a farmer forever, and he would certainly uh, give a hearty amen to what you just said. And as I mentioned earlier, the hypothetical radio host who consumed a couple of donuts today would also give you an amen because they are sitting like a lead balloon at this time. Uh, in the end, what is it that you hope comes from people reading Reclamation? Mm-hmm. I, I hope it just helps you process your own story. You know, we all have stories about our life and we get to determine what they mean. I mean, ultimately we can recategorize what a story means in our life and help use it to help lead us back to who we really are in the core. You know, we were talking earlier about the masterminds and I think part of what we all crave is just to be seen and and known. And, and by doing that, we can see ourselves too of like who we really are underneath some of these layers we've put there. And it might just be that you're seeing yourself more directly and then honoring that to move in a direction of, you know, what you really want. So hopefully that helps you find that. What about the person who reads it and doesn't like what they see in the mirror? What is the path to change? Does does the book kind of lay out some steps for how, you know, listen, if you do a self-analysis and all of a sudden you discover you don't like the the self you analyzed, Mm -hmm. let's get you pointed in the right direction. Yes, there's questions at the end of every chapter that hopefully will help you figure out what are some of the shifts you could make. So if you don't like how you're living or you know you'd like to change something, there were definitely parts of my life that I share in there that I know needed to change. And part of that is what we talked about, grace. Grace helps everything. You know, we're all, you know, striving to do our best and sometimes our best isn't that good and that's okay. And we can see it, realize, I don't want to do that anymore. Hmm. I can start to make a new decision. And, and if you mess it up the next day, you can start over again. It's, it's okay. We all do that. Good stuff. Uh, thanks for sharing uh, kind of your insights with us and um, for not going to California because nobody needs to go to California. That should be the takeaway from today's conversation. <laughs> Stay here in the Midwest where we have snow, no earthquakes, and uh, I don't know, some, at least we're in Big Ten country, right, mm-hmm. together. So it was great to meet you. We wish you nothing but the best with the book. And uh, thank you again. Thank you, Bill. Thanks for having me.